First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to this impressive conference. It's a great opportunity to provide a summary on the achievements of East Germany in the last 30 years and prospects for future development. Allow me also to thank the wonderful collaboration between the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy and the Halle Institute for Economic Research since 2014. It would have been a pleasure to meet you in person at this conference. Unfortunately, the world has been dramatically affected by the corona pandemic. Let us hope that mankind is capable to manage this challenge as well as possible and that we, as an enlightened society, can move a step forward to solve remaining issues of the 21st century successfully. My presentation today is dedicated to the 30th anniversary of German unification. I'm going to talk about the development path East Germany underwent during the last decades. It's challenges for the future and which lessons can be learned from the example of the German unification for economic integration processes in general. In the middle of 1989, a considerable number of citizens of the German Democratic Republic left the country and migrated to the Federal Republic of Germany. Together with the increase in disaffection with the contemporary political system, the GDR government decided to tear down the border controls and allow free movement within the two German states. It became obvious that the GDR would not longer exist in its current form. After free elections in the spring of 1990, a conservative-led government came into power and started unification negotiations with the government of the Federal Republic of Germany immediately. Unification was formally accomplished on the 3rd of October in 1990. This presentation starts by considering whether the case of East Germany can be regarded as a success story or not. It's widely acknowledged in the literature that living conditions in East Germany today are equivalent to those in West Germany. In particular, this holds true for liberty, including free movement of persons, goods and services, the production factors, etc. The education system, the system of social insurance, the provision of health care, culture, transport infrastructure, and the quality of housing. The variety of consumer goods and services and environmental conditions. Even private firms increase their economic performance considerably. The East German economy is better integrated in global value chains than in 1990. It can now take advantage of the division of labor and specialization. Moreover, East German trade deficit decreased remarkably. Finally, the East German economy proved to be resilient against shocks, particularly during the great financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. Overall, the German unification process can be considered a success. Having said this, there are still some shortcomings in East Germany that have to be solved in the future. The most visible one is the overall economic performance in terms of productivity. So far, the East German economy was not capable to catch up fully to the West German productivity level. The figure on the slide shows the productivity gap between East and West Germany in terms of gross domestic product per worker and working hour. This differentiation makes sense as volume of work is significantly higher in East Germany. Both graphs represent East German productivity relative to, to the West German level. If we exclude Berlin, East German GDP per worker was at roughly one-third of the West German level in 1991. From 1991 to the mid of the 1990s, the East German economy grew very fast. However, the pace of convergence slowed down and is now progressing only incrementally. In 2019, the productivity gap amounted to about 20%. If we include Berlin to East Germany, the difference is slightly smaller. The productivity gap is then approximately 16% as of 2019. For various reasons, it might be suitable to exclude Berlin from the calculations, as it represents a special case as the capital of Germany, although it geographically belongs to East Germany. As mentioned before, the number of average working hours per week is higher in East Germany, which would reduce productivity figures. Using this productivity measure, East Germany's productivity is 77% of the West German level. To conclude, irrespective of the type of productivity measures used, there's evidence that the pace of convergence slowed down and the productivity gap between East and West Germany is still visible. 
This figure considers differences in firm size between East and West Germany. The graph on the left hand side shows that the share of workers in large firms, this includes firms above 250 employees, is indeed greater in West Germany. The graph at the right hand side presents productivity figures in terms of gross value added per worker. It reveals the expected positive relation between firm size and productivity. This graph also differentiates between East and West German firms. Interestingly, it shows that the productivity gap is visible across all firm sizes. In other words, the lack of large firms in East Germany cannot fully explain the productivity gap at the aggregate level. Further estimations show that the productivity gap of East German firms of all sizes is at least 20%, even if one controls for structural differences. This includes industry classification, the structure of the labor force, and capital intensity. Which conclusions can be drawn from the development of East Germany after unification, in which lessons are generalizable for economic integration processes in general? First, Germany as a whole, and East Germany in particular, have achieved a lot in the last 30 years since reunification. The main shortcoming in East Germany is the productivity gap relative to West Germany. This gap is bigger for East German cities when compared with their West German counterparts. Rural areas in East Germany converged faster to rural areas in the western part of the country. A common explanation for the productivity gap in the literature is the lack of large and very large enterprises particularly those with headquarter functions in East Germany. Although there is a lot of evidence for the idea that these types of firms are underrepresented in East Germany, this argument is only one part of the story. The productivity gap is visible over all firm size classes. Recent research provided some in-depth analysis of the productivity gap by decomposing revenue productivity into a price and a quantity term. It is shown that the productivity gap is driven by lower physical productivity when producing the same price segments of their West German counterparts. A recent trend in the literature emphasizes historical differences between East and West Germany as possible drivers for the economic development of East Germany after unification. This applies to economic, political, cultural, and general differences before World War II, differences due to war damages and occupation forces, and finally differences as a result of selective outmigration out from East to West Germany for the Berlin Wall. Depending on the direction of the influence, these differences might lead to an upward or downward bias of the effects of the exposure to a centrally planned economy. These persistent differences may result in longer convergence processes of East Germany than originally expected. A crucial challenge for the future economic development of the East German economy is demography. Population projections suggest that East Germany as a whole will lose considerable parts of in its inhabitants. However, East Germany will not be affected equally by the population decline. Large cities are attractive, particularly for young and well-educated people, which leads to an increase in the number of inhabitants in these regions. On the other hand, this is connected to a greater loss of population in rural regions. Against its backdrop, it is all the more important that remaining population is well educated. Unfortunately, it is particularly the East German regions that are characterized by high dropout rates from school. Doubtless, the reduction of the rate of dropouts represents an important field for economic policy. However, the effects of this policy will be visible only in the very long run. In the short and the medium run, economic policy should enable structural change towards a competitive firm landscape. Here, Germany has an effective instrument for regional policy, providing grants for the modernization of the capital stock in private firms and business-related infrastructures in structural weak regions. The program is effective in terms of safeguarding and creating jobs but shows no effect with respect to productivity growth. 
as a productivity gap represents the major shortcoming in the East German economy. This program should be reweighted in the future and should reweight its targets and focus on the improvement of firm competitiveness in the future without losing the sight of the employment target. Let me now thank you for your attention. I look forward to lively and fruitful discussions.